You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Monster House presents... Monster Talk's a proud member of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Home of such shows as... Kick-Ass News, Movie Therapy, and Therapist Uncensored. If you'd like to advertise on the show, contact sales at advertisecast.com. It's actually quite unlike anything we've ever seen before. A giant hairy creature, part ape, part man. In Loch Ness, a 24-mile-long bottomless lake in the highlands of Scotland. It's a creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. Monster Talk. Hey there, Monster Talkers. It's me, Blake Smith. It was the night before Christmas, and all through your ears, the urge to write parody quite disappears. It's time for our version of A Ghost Story for Christmas. In the tradition of the Victorians and the BBC holiday adaptations of M.R. James and others, I've been trying to keep the tradition of ghost stories at Christmas alive. Last year, I got to take a wonderful trip to Stanford University, and while I was there, I binged ghost stories as I walked around the California scrub and mountains. One of the stories I read is A Strange Wedding Tale. That's our primary selection for this episode. Now, I'm also doing a bonus for our patrons, so if you're hearing this on Patreon, you're going to be getting two stories, the latter of which is by Ambrose Bierce, and its selection was also inspired by my wanderings in the hills of Palo Alto. Without further ado, a ghost story for Christmas. Monster Talk. John Charrington's Wedding by Edith Nesbitt. No one ever thought that May Forrester would marry John Charrington, but he thought differently. And things which John Charrington intended had a queer way of coming to pass. He asked her to marry him before he went up to Oxford. She laughed and refused him. He asked her again next time he came home. Again, she laughed, tossed her dainty blonde head, and again refused. A third time he asked her. She said it was becoming a confirmed bad habit and laughed at him more than ever. John was not the only man who wanted to marry her. She was the belle of our village coterie. And we were all in love with her, more or less. It was sort of a fashion like heliotrope ties or Inverness capes. Therefore, we were as much annoyed as surprised when John Charrington walked into our little local club, we held it in a loft over Sadler's, I remember, and invited us all to his wedding. Your wedding? You don't mean it. Who's the happy pair? When's it to be? John Charrington filled his pipe and lighted it before he replied, and then he said, I'm sorry to deprive you fellows of your only joke, but Miss Forrester and I are to be married in September. You don't mean it. Ah, he's gotten mitten again. He's turned his head. No, I said, rising. I see it's true. Lend me a pistol, someone, or a first-class fare to the end of nowhere. Charrington has bewitched the only pretty girl in our 20-mile radius. Was it mesmerism or a love potion, Jack? Neither, sir, but a gift you'll never have? Perseverance, and the best luck a man ever had in this world. There was something in his voice that silenced me, and all chaff of the other fellows failed to draw him further. The queer thing about it was that when we congratulated Miss Forrester, she blushed and smiled and dimpled for all the world as though... She were in love with him, and had been in love with him the whole time. Upon my word, I think she had. Women are strange creatures. We were all asked to the wedding. In Brixham, everyone who was anybody knew everybody else who was anyone. My sisters were, I truly believe, more interested in the trousseau 
than the bride herself, and I was to be the best man. The coming marriage was much canvassed at afternoon tea tables and at our little club over the Saddlers, and the question was always asked, does she care for him? I used to ask that question myself in the early days of their engagement, but after a certain evening in August, I never asked it again. I was coming home from the club through the churchyard. Our church is on a time-grown hill, and the turf about it is so thick and soft that one's footsteps are noiseless. I made no sound as I vaulted the low, lichened wall and threaded my way between the tombstones. It was at the same instant that I heard John Charrington's voice and saw her. May was sitting on a low, flat gravestone, her face turned towards the full splendor of the western sun. Its expression ended at once and forever any question of love for him. It was transfigured to a beauty I should not have believed possible even to that beautiful little face. John lay at her feet, and it was his voice that broke the stillness of the golden August evening. My dear, my dear, I believe I should come back from the dead if you wanted me. <clears throat> I coughed at once to indicate my presence and passed on into the shadow, fully enlightened. The wedding was to be in early September, two days before I had to run up to town on business. The train was late, of course, for we were on the southeastern, and as I stood grumbling with my watch in my hand, whom should I see but John Charrington and May Forrester? They were walking up and down the unfrequented end of the platform, arm in arm, looking into each other's eyes, careless of the sympathetic interest of the porters. Of course, I knew better than to hesitate a moment before burying myself in the booking office, and it was not till the train drew up at the platform that I obtrusively passed the pair with my Gladstone and took the corner in a first-class smoking carriage. I did this with as good an air of not seeing them as I could assume. I pride myself on it, my discretion. But if John were traveling alone, I wanted his company. I had it. Hello, old man, came his cheery voice as he swung his bag into my carriage. Here's luck. I was expecting a dull journey. Where are you off to, I asked, direction still bidding me turn my eyes away, though I saw without looking that hers were red-rimmed. To old Brambridge's, he answered, shutting the door and leaning out for a last word with his sweetheart. Oh, I wish you wouldn't go, John, she was saying in a low, earnest voice. I feel certain something will happen. Do you think I should let anything happen to me and the day after tomorrow our wedding day? Don't go, she answered, with a pleading intensity which would have sent my Gladstone onto the platform and me after it, but she wasn't speaking to me. John Charrington was made differently. He rarely changed his opinions and never his resolutions. He only stroked the little ungloved hands that lay on the carriage door. I must, May. The old boy's been awfully good to me, and now he's dying, and I must go see him. But I shall come home in time for... The rest of the parting was lost in a whisper and in the rattling lurch of the train starting. You're sure to come, she spoke as the train moved. Nothing shall keep me, he answered, and we steamed out. After he'd seen the last of the little figure on the platform, he leaned back in the corner and kept silence for a minute. When he spoke, it was to explain to me that his godfather, whose heir he was, lay dying at Peace Marsh Place some 50 miles away, and he had sent for John, and John had felt bound to go. I shall be surely back tomorrow, he said, or if not, the day after, in heaps of time. Thank heaven. One hasn't to get up in the middle of the night to get married nowadays. And suppose Mr. Brembridge dies? Oh, alive or dead, I mean to be married on Thursday, John answered, lighting a cigar and unfolding the times. At Peasmore Station, we said goodbye, and he got out, and I saw him right off. I went on to London, where I stayed the night. When I got home the next afternoon, a very wet one, by the way, my sister greeted me with, Where's Mr. Charrington? Goodness knows, I answered testily. Every man since Cain has resented this kind of question. 
Oh, I thought you might have heard from him, she went on. As you were to give him away tomorrow. Isn't he back? I asked, for I had confidently expected to find him at home. No, Joffrey. My sister, Fanny, always had a way of jumping to conclusions, especially such conclusions as were the least favorable to her fellow creatures. He's not returned, and what is more, you may depend upon it, he won't. You mark my words, there will be no wedding tomorrow. My sister, Fanny, has a power of annoying me which no other human being possesses. You mark my words, I retorted with asperity. You had better give up making such a thundering idiot of yourself. There'll be more wedding tomorrow than ever you'll take part in. A prophecy which, by the way, came true. But though I could snarl confidently to my sister, I did not feel so comfortable when late that night, I, standing on the doorstep of John's house, heard that he had not returned. I went gloomily through the rain. Next morning brought a brilliant blue sky, gold sun, and all the softness of air and beauty of cloud as go to make a perfect day. Next morning brought a brilliant blue sky, gold sun, and all such softness of air and beauty of cloud as go to make up a perfect day. I woke with a vague feeling of having gone to bed anxious and of being rather averse to facing that anxiety in the light of full wakefulness. But with my shaving water came a note from John, which relieved my mind and sent me up to the forester's with a light heart. May was in the garden. I saw her blue gown through the hollyhocks as the lodge gate swung to behind me. So I did not go up to the house, but turned aside down the turfed path. He's written to you too, she said without preliminary greeting when I reached her side. Yes, I'm to meet him at the station at three and come straight to the church. Her face looks pale. There was a brightness in her eyes and a tender quiver about the mouth that spoke of renewed happiness. Mr. Brambridge begged him to stay another night that he had not the heart to refuse. She went on, He's so kind, but I wish he hadn't stayed. I was at the station at half past two. I felt rather annoyed with John. It seemed a sort of slight to the beautiful girl who loved him that he should come, as it were, out of breath and with the dust of travel upon him, to take her hand, which some of us would have given the best years of our lives to take. But when the three o'clock train glided in, and glided out again, having brought no passengers to our little station, I was more than annoyed. There was no other train for 35 minutes. I calculated that, with much hurry, we might just get to the church in time for the ceremony, but oh, what a fool to miss that first train. What other man could have done it? That 35 minutes seemed a year as I wandered around the station reading the advertisements and the timetables and the company's bylaws and getting more and more angry with John Charrington. This confidence in his own power of getting everything he wanted the minute he wanted it was leading him too far. I hate waiting. Everyone does, but I, I believe I hate it more than anyone else. The 335 was late, of course. Drive to the church, I said as someone shut the door. Mr. Charrington hasn't come by this train. I ground my pipe between my teeth and stamped with impatience as I watched the signals click. The signal went down. Five minutes later, I flung myself into the carriage that I had brought for John. Anxiety now replaced anger. What had become of the man? Could he have suddenly taken ill? I had never known him to have a day's illness in his life, and even so, he might have telegraphed. Some awful accident must have happened. The thought that he had played her faults? Never. No, not for a moment entered my head. Yes, some terrible thing had happened to him, and on me lay the task of telling his bride... I almost wished the carriage would upset, break my head so that someone else might tell her. Not I, who... Uh, but that's nothing to do with this story. It was five minutes to four as we drew up at the churchyard gate. A double row of eager onlookers lined the path from Lichgate to Porch. I sprang from the carriage and passed up between them. Our gardener had a good front place near the door. I stopped. Are they waiting still, Biles? I asked, simply to gain time, for, of course, I knew they were waiting by the crowd's attentive attitude. Well, waiting, sir? No, 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 sir. Why, why, it must be over by now. 
over with it, then Mr. Charrington's come. To the minute, sir. Must have missed you somehow. And I say, sir, lowering his voice, I never see Mr. John the least bit so afore, but my opinion is he's been drinking pretty free. His clothes was all dusty and his face like a sheet. I tell you, I didn't like the looks of him at all, and the folks inside are saying all sorts of things. You'll see, something's gone very wrong with Mr. John, and he's tried liquor. He looked like a ghost, and he went with his eyes straight before him and never look a word for none of us, him that was always such a gentleman. I had never heard Biles make so long a speech. The crowd in the churchyard were talking in whispers and getting ready rice and slippers to throw at the bride and the bridegroom. The ringers were already ready with their hands on the rope to ring out the merry peal as the bride and bridegroom should come out. A murmur from the church announced them, and out they came. Biles was right. John Sherrington did not look himself. There was dust on his coat, and his hair was disarranged. He seemed to have been in some row, for there was a black mark above his eyebrow. He was deathly pale, but his pallor was not greater than that of the bride, who might have been carved in ivory. Dress, veil, orange blossoms, face and all. As they passed out, the ringers stopped. There were six of them. And then, on the ears expecting the gay wedding peal, came the slow tolling of the passing bell. A thrill of horror at so foolish a jest from the ringers passed through us all. But the ringers themselves dropped the ropes and fled like rabbits out into the sunlight. The bride shuddered, and gray shadows came about her mouth. But the bridegroom led her on down the path where the people stood with the handfuls of rice. But the handfuls were never thrown, and the wedding bells never rang. In vain, the ringers were urged to remedy their mistake. They protested with many whispered expletives that they would see themselves further first. In a hush like the hush in the chamber of death, the bridal pair passed into their carriage and his door slammed behind them. Then the tongues were loosed, a babble of anger and wonder, conjecture from the guests and the spectators. If I had seen his condition, sir, said old Forrester to me as we drove off, I would have stretched him on the floor of the church, sir, by heaven I would, before I'd have let him marry my daughter." And then he put his head out the window. Drive like hell, he cried to the coachman. Don't spare the horses. He was obeyed. We passed the bride's carriage. I forebode to look at it. An old forester turned his head away and swore. We reached home before it. We stood in the doorway in the blazing afternoon sun. And in about half a minute, we heard wheels crunching on the gravel. When the carriage stopped in front of the steps, old forester and I ran down. Great heaven, the carriage is empty, and yet... I had the door open in a minute, and this is what I saw. No sign of John Charrington. And of May, his wife, only a huddled heap of white satin lying half on the floor of the carriage and half on the seat. I drove straight here, sir, said the coachman, as the bride's father lifted her out. And I'll swear no one got out of the carriage. We carried her into the house in her bridal dress and drew back her veil. I saw her face. Shall I ever forget it? White, white and drawn with agony and horror, bearing such a look of terror as I have never seen since except in dreams. And her hair, her radiant blonde hair, I tell you it was white like snow. As we stood, her father and I, half mad with the horror and mystery of it, a boy came up the avenue a telegraph boy. They brought the orange envelope to me, and I tore it open. Mr. Charrington was thrown from the dog cart on his way to the station at half past one, killed on the spot. And he was married to May Forster in our parish church at half past three, in the presence of half the parish. I shall be married, dead or alive. 
What had passed in that carriage on the homeward drive? No one knows. No one will ever know. Oh, May. Oh, my dear. Before a week was over, they laid her beside her husband in our little churchyard on the time-covered hill, the churchyard where they had kept their love trysts. Thus was accomplished John Charrington's wedding. This has been a Monster House presentation.